Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the panel that we're about to begin. Uh, we're going to be talking about the winning strategies in this era of change and transformation and, and challenge. We just heard from the last presentation a, a great deal of data that just kind of describes what's going on. Uh, now we want to talk uh, to three of the best sources in the industry that can help us navigate this period of change and understand how to cope with it, how to take advantage of it, how to emerge of it from it uh, in, a, in a winning way. Uh, and that's really what change provides. There's gonna be winners, there's gonna be losers. Uh, we're gonna be the winners. And it's sort of a, a, a continuation of the conference that was held uh, in, Los, in, in the Long Beach last, uh, last week, which was the Clean Air Future Transportation conference uh, all time. Interestingly, uh, like was just presented, 85% of the fleet operators said this year they're going to be expanding their use of uh, transformative uh, fuels, engines, and other systems. So we're right in the middle of it. Well, we have a great panel, and this extends that conference to those practitioners, the best in the industry, that can help us all craft for ourselves uh, the, the best way to, to, uh, to cope with the change. And also, if you have questions or chats or suggestions, uh, please feel free to offer them and uh, we can see them. So we got three, the three best uh, parts of the business represented. Uh, we've got uh, Mundar Digni, who is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at NAPIDE, which as you know, is a leading vocational work and uh, truck body manufacturer. They're, they the upfitter of upfitters. Uh, Mandar's been there for like 25 years. Uh, he's a- No, you know, not 10 years, about 10 years. 10 years. He's been doing this for 25 years. Uh, and uh, he's, he's, he's one of the expert uh, voices in the industry. Um, now, one of the reasons that we've chose these, these three individuals representing these companies is that we all know change, uh, successful change is a, needed uh, accomplishment of companies that can make it over the long term. So we've got three companies that have proven that. Um, NAPIDE has done that. NAPIDE is a sixth generation company. It was founded in 1848. Uh, so if, if, if you started building um, upfits for wagons in 1848 and you're today growing and still a leader, you're doing something right, you're able to cope with change. So uh, we, we'd like to hear from, from Mandar as, as we go through this. Uh, Kirk Mann, uh, he's Senior Vice President, General Manager of Transportation Finance at Mitsubishi HC Capital America, which is, uh, was Hitachi and now Mitsubishi. Two of the global Japanese powerhouses have come together and uh, so, Mandar can help us with how, how we upfit and how we align the product uh, for uh, the use in our commercial customers. Of course, Kirk is the, the financial side of it, how we're gonna buy it, own it, uh, and use it uh, in terms of the cost, finances. And, I, and he's been, he's also, you know, Mitsubishi just joined with Hitachi. Again, a company that goes back a ways. Hitachi actually started in 1910 and believe it or not, they were the first manufacturer of induction electric motors in Japan. Oh, wow. uh, and one of the first, they, they made a, a breakthrough and they made a five horsepower electric. So they, they know the electric business. Mitsubishi started in 1880. A samurai uh, began the Mitsubishi group. And uh, so they, they've gone through a lot of change as well. Uh, you have a sword there, Kirk? Is that part of your... Uh, not on camera, yeah. Not on camera. <laughs> not on camera. Okay, well, that's good. And Tony Stinza. Tony is the vice president of used truck operations at Navistar. Navistar, uh oh, what happened? I lost everybody. <laughs> we got you still, Jim. Keep talking. Yeah, we're here. Me? Oh, I yep, carry you. Yep. Okay. I don't know what happened. Navistar. Is, is, a, is a, a great story. Uh, they, of course, Navistar is at the OEM. So we've got the OEM, we've got the finance, we've got the upfit. Uh, he's the vice president of used truck operations at Navistar, uh, but he's, he's been in the financial side. 
Uh, he's run the uh, class four and five businesses. Uh, he's headed up procurement and power trains. He's been through the whole process at an OEM uh, and he was involved in the procurement for a long time. Now, Navistar goes back to 1831 when old C.W. McCormick put a grain reaping machine together and it began McCormick harvesting. So look at, the, look at the sage advice that we're gonna get from these three gentlemen as we go through this process. And I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to it, but they know how to change. Companies that change uh, make it to the next level. So we'd like to begin, before we talk about it, of course, all the environment that we're changing, we know about all these things that are occurring. The, uh, by 2045, they're not gonna have diesel in California. Uh, diesel, short-term things that are happening. Diesel is over $6 a gallon today. Uh, so there's some short-term things that are, that are causing change to occur. Uh, it was interesting, I read where, just as a point, what does that cost? Each of these UPS trucks you see driving around, they go through about 20,000 gallons a year of fuel. And there's 120,000 of them. Uh, so I mean, this is this is a this is a, a large change that's occurring. COVID no, has caused you know last mile delivery, near shoring, uh, ownership models are changing, connected cars, intermodal, autonomous AI, all this stuff that we're going to contend with. So if we could go through it, you didn't want to hear from me, but I want to hear from the panelists. As you see, and we before we talk about coping with change and our strategies, could you describe? how you see in your particular part of the business, what change means? What, what are the, the key drivers uh, that are causing change? And how do you define change from a upfitter, from, uh, from a finance uh, source and, and from a uh, OEM? So uh, Mundar, can we start with you in terms of kind of describe how you see what changes we face, kind of what's driving it? Yeah, well, first, good morning, everybody. It's great to uh, great to see my four friends here on the screen, my three friends on the screen, and hopefully uh, everybody else out there. It's uh, great to be here with you today. Um, you know, change change for um, I'll tell you the last year, two years, change uh, in my career. I've never seen change happening as as dramatic as it's been happening here recently. Um, you know, when you think about it from an upfitting standpoint, at the end of the day, our job is to put the right or help design, build, install the right, you know, body or tool on the vehicle, right? Or, or the, the truck vehicle chassis, via, you know, for utility pickup to make the job, uh, make the job work. So the biggest change that we're seeing, I would say, number one, this change in powertrain strategies, right? So when you're when you're looking at electrical, when you're looking at other technologies, um, you know how each of the OEMs is is approaching that, you know, with with the battery technologies or the drive tra drive line technologies, anything like that. Um, that's a big change that we're dealing with on the upfitting side. And I know there's a couple other presenters over the next next day or so that'll be talking about that change, but you know, working with the OEMs to understand how they're employing those technologies. And then what does that mean as a result and the effect? What does that mean for the body designs? What does it mean for the installation designs? What's it mean for the ancillary equipment that we're putting on these vehicles? Um, that's a big, that's a big change um, for, for the upfitting and uh, equipment side of the business. Um, I'm sure that, I'm sure that Kurt and Tony will talk about the, you know, the chassis acquisition and the, the, and the truck sales and acquisition side of it. But, but, um, you know that that's a big that's a big change that we're all dealing with going forward. Amanda, just a quick question on that: is how 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 well are you able to coordinate with the OEM, the chassis manufacturers? Because that sort of puts you in a much closer alignment necessary. Uh, to yeah, I think those I think one of the challenges that all body manufacturers and upfitters are are uh, are dealing with, and I, I think we're dealing as an industry, we're dealing with it pretty effectively, is staying close to the OEMs to understand, you know, what changes are happening and understanding what are the design changes coming up, you know, two, three, four, five, in some cases, even, you know, more than that years down the road and making sure that our products are ready to go when those vehicles hit the market, right? Um, we all know that, you know, it, it, sometimes, you know, the dog 
the tail, right? So in this case, that chassis hits the row. When it gets produced and starts coming out to the market, we better be ready with the right solution sets. The industry better be ready with the, with the right solution sets for the back of the vehicle or inside that vehicle. And um, you know, it's really, it's really, it's really driving the need for uh, driving the need and also creating greater communication with the OEMs with the rest of the industry to make sure we understand what technologies and geometries they're implementing. All right, that's great. Uh, Kirk, how about from your perspective? Uh, how do you what what is change meaning to your business, uh, and what's really yeah. driving? Well, thank you, Jim. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be with you again today. I uh, I, I would uh, echo uh, what you and, and Mondar were just talking about. And that is, you know, body companies are getting closer to chassis manufacturers, and we're we're keeping our pulse on the supply chain and and everything that's going on inside of that supply chain. And you know, we have uh, and and as do many lenders have the ability to lend in all of the different places in that supply chain. So we're watching it and uh, making sure that we have products that are relevant, that are going to be relevant uh, in, in the future uh, world. And, um, you know, it may not come to complete fruition for 10 years. And so, you know, a guy like me who's, you know, I may be retired in 10 years, uh, but I still think it's important for us to be thinking about these things and understanding them so we do hand off uh, a business that is relevant to the people that are coming behind us. Um, I, I kind of simplify this, this thing with uh, the acronym CASE, um, and I have a little twist on the end, but uh, when you think about the word CASE, C is for connectivity or connected, uh, A is autonomous, S is for shared, and E is for electric. Or you could replace that word with, uh, you know, clean. You just have to be a C E, uh, clean uh, tech. So, I mean, th that really kind of uh, summarizes the systems that we're going to have to be looking at and understanding so that we can actually de deliver financial solutions into that environment. The, the, uh, the ecosystem that surrounds that, um, that end user is embedded with a number of different supply chains in it. And so we want to understand each of those supply chains and how we can make sure that we're delivering value to, to our customers. And I know a lot of lenders are, are doing the same. Uh, so, I mean, it could be anything from, you know, subscription financing, the, the telematics plus AI uh, development. Um, it could be, you know, the chassis and the body itself, which we have, but historically no one's ever asked us to finance a, a truck in the gas station. Today, they're asking us to finance the truck and the charging solution. Mm -hmm. So we've mm -hmm. capable to do that. And so it, it's, a, it's a dynamic, uh, ever-changing environment. And it's kind of an exciting time to be, uh, to be in this business, no doubt about it. That's, that's interesting. <clears throat> Have you seen uh, demand rising for different ownership structure uh, or, or systems of ownership or subscriptions? How, how is well, that change occurring we, now? Yeah, we are definitely seeing uh, certain organizations who are willing to step up and take the risk of asset ownership and then provide the kind of shared equipment uh, and, and produce inside that environment a connected environment that delivers more value to the customers that they're serving. So, you know, uh, but at the same time, um, you know, in, in uh, visiting with uh, some folks at Amazon, you know, they, they like the independent contractor because the independent contractor will use uh, the software system that Amazon has. That doesn't mean that Amazon doesn't use big fleets because they do. Uh, big fleets have their own systems, but it really does provide for a measure of connectivity for the shipper that, that is, is very helpful. So, you know, we're, we're, seeing some, we're seeing a combination of, you know, people who want to own assets and deliver value to people who need them to, you know, operate their business. Uh, and then also at the same time, a little bit of a rise in that independent contractor world. But those independent contractors can use equipment that may be owned by someone else and share it. 
Uh, it just depends on the situation. So we are seeing some of that going. That's just starting, but it's an accelerate. Tony, yeah. how about from the OEM perspective? You, you're sort of in the middle for engineering as well as distribution and yep. product development. Uh, what, how do you see this changing your business and, and basically what's driving it? Well, I, I think obviously the things people have talked about, the technological change in, um, in products is happening. Uh -huh. Um, a lot of that is driven by the regulatory change, and we need to stay close and understand what, what's going on there. But I think another thing with the digitization of processes, um, what we're seeing is, is, is a, you know, a migration to different customer preferences. And I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll give a couple examples. Um, probably five years ago, we had a website where we sold our used trucks and I think somewhere around a third of, of the users were using mobile and the rest were kind of desktop browsing. And, and now our website is, I think the last time we looked at it, it was close to 85% usage on mobile. And so thinking about what that means, that means that when, when we're designing our website, we need to design it first for mobile, not, not for desktop. And, you know, those mm -hmm. kinds of things are happening. Um, the other, the other thing is just the, if you think about your own life and, and how, how things have gone, uh, used to, I don't know if anybody remembers this, but used to have to actually go into the gas station and pay. <laughs> I don't know if any, I don't know anybody who still does that anymore. Most people pay at the pump, but that kind of thing if you think about the analogy for our retail business, um, buying a truck, we need to cater to a person who wants to do their entire transaction kind of online without talking to somebody and also um, cater to the other end of the spectrum of about a, a person who uh, is, is a little afraid and has to sneak up on their computer. And, and we have to be able to do that kind of um, ha have a, a process that allows people to step out, out of um, the virtual world into a people-based process um, anywhere they want to along the way. So um, those are some of the changes that are facing some of the retail, um, retail side of our business for used trucks at least. That's great. The, and also product-wise, <clears throat> You know, you're uh, you're innovating new products. We all talk about electrification. You know, Kirk mentioned that. But between now and then, there's a lot of things that are happening from clean diesel uh, to propane uh, to compressed natural gas. Uh, you know, that. how do you see those changes occurring uh, and how, how quickly? Um, you know, our company looks at it and, and we've, we've had uh, our CEO went to the ACT conference and spoke about this uh, last week, but um, we're viewing that, that the TCO parity for EVs, for instance, is, is going to be um, happening much sooner than, than had been anticipated. The the pace of change in battery technology and things like that is is um, pretty promising, and so you know we're we're having to figure out how to um, how to make this shift. And our our intention as a company is is to move towards more sustainable solutions. Um, the one thing we have to do, I, I'm kind of at the back end of that business because I have the used trucks, and I'm I'm still going to be dealing with um, ice-based products probably longer than, than anybody on the new truck side too. So um, we just like I talked about in the digitization process, um, I think you know, we're gonna have to live in both worlds for, for probably quite a while. That's, that's a great point. Now, Mandor, maybe we can uh, pivot to, now we, and we all understand by our different businesses, what changes, how it's defined. What, what are you doing? What do you see at NAPHI and what are you doing in your areas of responsibility strategically 
uh, to to ensure that you are able to take advantage of this period of change? Is it resources, well, organization, strategy? What what do you do different tomorrow than you did last year? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you something that um, you know. Change change. This big change of the change of uh, you know going to electrification or alternative energy sources. It's driving a lot of opportunity for us today in terms of supporting our customers from a, um, you know, just the, the, the folks that are building infrastructure, the ones where a lot of demand is coming from, right? So, I mean, if you think about it, you know, we need to start building, and it's not if, it's we do need to start building all the charging infrastructure around the country. We've got to build the power gen infrastructure around the country. All that stuff is going to happen. So, you know, that demand is pretty high right now. Um, so from a, from a, how do we address that in the marketplace? How do we address, um, so it's kind of twofold. There's, there's existing, there's existing customers that have increased demand because they're being challenged to support this infrastructure change. Then there's another set of customers that are, okay, I'm considering this type of a vehicle, this new type of a vehicle, right? That has a different powertrain system and we need to think about things. So, you know, from our standpoint, our, our team here at NAPI has to be able to, you know, support our current customer base with their needs and demands, right? So, the, again, it's planning. It's a little bit more of, you know, instead of just, instead of just, um, and we don't typically do this anyway, but instead of pitching, pitching bodies, we're talking about, okay, what does your outlook look like? How do we need to plan for this coming forward? Because there's going to be a wave of work that's going to be coming our way across the country to make all this infrastructure come together, and we're really looking forward to supporting that. On the flip side, when it comes to customers that are considering alternative technology for propulsion needs, um, it's a lot again, a lot of listening, a lot of uh, coordination with their operations folks, along with the OEM that they're working with, with their uh, engineering teams to understand. Okay, how do you how do you make all the stuff that they do today? How do we make all that stuff fit on this new chassis or this new platform with a different, you know, different technology in it and make it more efficient and make it more productive and make it more cost efficient? I know Kurt's nodding on that because it's a big deal, right? Um, and, and on top of it, I know Tony, my, my friend Tony on the U side, at some point that truck's going to be, at some point they're going to have a residual that they're going to have to deal with. So there's all kinds of things that we're dealing with. And, um, you know, I'll be honest with you. It's a it's a time of it's a time in my head. There's a lot of gear shifting because it's a different it's a different time frame. It's a lot different than you know if you go back three years, four or five years ago. You know how business was being conducted to how what are the environmental uh, perspectives we're looking at now in our business uh, environment. Uh, there's a lot of different things we're considering. So um, yeah, there's a lot of change and and uh, like you said, change is change is inevitable. Change can be sometimes hurt. Change can be painful sometimes, but it's our job as leaders in the industry and everybody listening to, to manage through that change and, and make it effective for, uh, you know, for our customers and, and for our country going forward. You know, and that you said something really interesting, and that is you've got to manage both an old business and a new business. Sure. And that yeah. is that stretching your budgets? Are you, uh, how do you, and it's also interesting because we're taking profits from uh, old, old business and we're investing it in new business that frankly isn't there yet. Uh, it's coming. I don't, do I, I don't think, I think, I, I think, I think we've been able, you know, like you said, our company has been around for a very long time and we've been through these technological changes before, right? I mean, you go from, you know, wagons to auto, wagons to propulsion vehicles, propulsion, you know, from wood bodies to steel bodies, steel bodies to this body, that body, everything, you know, so it, it's how you manage that change. I'm not so sure it's necessarily a, a, a budget buster, but it's again, making sure that we're looking ahead to make sure we have the tools in place to manage through these changes is what's critical. Um, so, you know, in this period of rapid change where everybody's, you know, when we look at the OEMs and, you know, everybody's got a different, you know, everybody's pretty much saying, okay, EV is where we got to go. I, I think we can all agree to that. I think, you know, but, but how each OEM is adapting to that, to that mantra is different, right? So for us to be able to work with the OEMs and their design language, uh, for us to be able to to understand, you know, with our with end customers with fleets on what their requirements are going to be, 
Um, it's what we do on a daily basis. It's what we've done before. It's just we're trying to accelerate working through that appropriately. And I think it's rather than a wholesale change of effort for resources, it's, it's a it's a it's a more concerted effort to shift and rethink how we do things today with our current resources to make it work. Um, you know, so I think that's a big deal. When when you look at when you look at it, when you look at things like EVs, you know, from a body standpoint, um, you know, do we need to consider alternative materials? Do we need to think about more of this versus that? Um, and that that's just part of a, na a standard, I think, uh, you know, capital planning cycle and thought process that that all of us in the industry are kind of going through right now. So uh, it's definitely a challenging time, but it's fun. That's for sure. Has, has it has it changed the people you're hiring? Do you need to uh, have, have you have you seen that there's a mismatch of the resource of people, or uh, can you adapt? Um, I think I think we're doing I think we're doing a little bit of both. I mean, I think Tony, you know, Tony described it a second ago with the changes in the digitization of the sales process, right? I mean. I think we adapt, um, and as we look at as we look at new talent going forward, we we make sure that those those skill sets or understanding of those skill sets is is on board. Um, but but I think you know helping helping our current teams adapt is 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 important. We've got to just make sure we understand how it all works and make sure we got it going in the right direction. Um, and as we look forward, there's going to be new skill sets, and it's going to be critical that we uh, that we bring those right people on board. But um, but um, I'm not seeing a wholesale, you know, wholesale change of who we got, you know, in our, in our, in our industry, in our industry, let's just say knowledge equity is pretty important. <laughs> right? Yeah. So, you know, if you, if you, if, you know, just because, just because, you know, someone doesn't know how to do a, you know, how to build a digital website, that's going to be outweighed by someone that understands that we functionally need this to go on there. And here's how you physically make that happen. You know that that's a very 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 valuable resource that uh, I hope we continue to value through the uh, through the future. That's interesting because when you have these autonomous vehicles, they're going to want you to have a robot on the back that when the autonomous vehicle gets to the job site, the your upfit does an autonomous job. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, and and again, it's 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 close coordination with the with the other equipment manufacturers, right? I mean, if our body, you know, if the body we design has to work with some kind of robotically assisted lift or a, you know, remote remote operated, let's say, you know, compressor slash welding package. I mean, it just all has to work, so that coordination is critical. Oh, great. Okay. Well, how about? Kirk, moving on to the how we buy them and finance, and your company is going through change as it's being created. But what what are you doing? What strategically are you doing, and how are you, how are you uh, developing plans to go forward? Uh, and I guess especially when it comes to residuals and leasing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, about uh, about four years ago, uh, we put some resource to um, this environment, and and we had one person um, really uh, flying all over the country, having conversations with different people. And today, I would say on the whole, we we probably have maybe ten people that are, you know, really across all of MHCA, really looking into and connecting the dots. Uh, on all of this, and one of the things that that is consistently presented to us are the, is the need for residual, uh, and and the reason it's there, the need is there, is because the equipment is so expensive, um, and so those residuals are very important to make the total cost of ownership sort of come into line. Well, I said this, I think three years ago um, on one of these fireside chats, Jim, that you know we didn't have a clue. Uh, how these units were go going to value out over the next three, four, or five years. And so, and we still don't. Uh, nobody really does. So when we have conversations about residual valuation, we're looking for partnerships. Certainly the battery historically has been a big part of the cost. Battery cost is coming down, no doubt about it. Uh, but it still is a big part of the cost of that uh, equipment. And so to the extent that we can you know, established partnerships, and we have, uh, with organizations that are willing to take that battery 
and use it uh, in a in another market after it's been used in a truck, uh, that's that's a good first step. And so we're trying to drive solutions into the need. And uh, you know, I think our ice business, if you want to call it that, uh, is uh, certainly continuing continuing to function the way it historically has, but we've been able to take our existing resources in the ICE business and develop ways of accommodating the need for uh, EV trucks and charging solutions uh, that is consistent with our current process. But from a front end standpoint, it's different people working on the development. Um, but on the back end, we're, we're accommodating uh, those structures with uh, systemic solutions that will drive ease of use, right? So it's, it, it is definitely a little bit of a balancing act, as, as Mondar would say. Um, and you can't go so crazy on development that you sort of uh, soak up all of the, uh, the, the revenues that you generate in your core business and the business that we do a lot more of today. So it's, it's a process. Some of the companies out there, I can't remember who it was I was reading about the other day, had bought a couple of organizations just for the revenue base so they could take some of those dollars to invest in the, uh, the, uh, the clean energy technology that they're building. And uh, so you're seeing some consolidation along those lines just so there is more uh, investment available. Now, you know, with, with our company in particular, uh, and, and with most lenders, um, you see a, a pretty big emphasis on, you, you know, sustainable development goals, ESG, uh, and, and clean technology. Uh, but when you get right down to the bottom line of actually financing something, there are still some fundamental questions that we need to be able to answer and partnerships that we have to establish in order to be able to do it. Uh, those things are coming along. Certainly, the states have good incentives for uh, for doing some of this, and um, it's 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 an interesting world. It's a fun world, and we are every day looking and trying to find ways to meet all the needs from a financing standpoint. You know, in that regard, her, and Tony mentioned about the way people wanted to buy vehicles. We all know that the. The distribution channel doesn't sell vehicles, the finance companies do. So <laughs> have you have you seen also a, a move towards uh, a digital finance solution where it's all part of this uh, new process? Yeah, there there are companies springing up all over the place, FinTech solutions. Um, those fintech solutions haven't actually penetrated the environment yet, but I, I think they will. And we certainly want to be, you know, ready for that kind of offering. It's a little different than what we've, you know, historically done. I mean, we, uh, you know, you go buy a car today and if you need financing, you talk to the F&I manager and that's what happens in commercial uh, truck. And then the finance manager sends in an application to multiple finance companies. They come back with the best deal for the consumer. Um, and that's kind of the model and has been the model for a long time. Um, I'm going to date myself a little bit. But in 1992, I was traveling the country with a guy named Bernie Allard when I was working at the Associates. And I was the insurance guy. And Bernie was the finance. We were showing dealer pools how they could make more money if they would just hire an F&I manager. <laughs> and uh, much to our chagrin, they did it. Um, because all that did competition with a bunch of other lenders that we had no intention of driving, but that's, that's kind of how it worked out. Uh, so it, it's gonna be the same way, I think. Uh, even digitally, it may uh, expand you know, the number of lenders. I mean, if you look at Route 1 today, they have hundreds of lenders on there that dealers can, can focus on. But today, the dealers, uh, you know, they develop relationships with lenders, and that's the lender that they choose, even in Route 1, even though they have hundreds of lenders, you know, to work with. 
Um, so digitally, it, it'll change the landscape a little bit. I, I think relationships will not be as uh, impactful for lenders. I think, I think lenders that have good solutions uh, are going to be the ones that win. Also, like like Mundar said, the alignment between his business and the OEM, your business and the distribution channel has to become more aligned uh, and work together because it, as the customer doesn't want to have pieces, they want to have one continuous transaction. So, uh, to Tony, for, from your standpoint, uh, you've gone through a lot of change since your company founded when you were uh, making uh, grain harvesting machines uh, pulled by ox or or horse, but how are you seeing your company cope with it? What are you doing strategically? And then this whole issue, I think, is really important. How, how do you allocate the investments? You know, I, I, I in the automobile side of it, look at Renault, uh, who's actually selling core assets of the company so they can fund investments and same thing with Nissan or, and other companies are so they can fund the investments necessary for research and development because these investments aren't aren't creating near-term cash flow they're not return on investment uh, right. and, and and an overriding element of this whole area of change is that we have to find solutions that not only help the environment uh, and become sustainable, but are more efficient, make more money. Uh, and, and so to, to me, from, from your standpoint, what do you do? How, how, do you, how do you cope with that? And what strategy and what plans are you implementing? Well, I, first of all, um, if anybody, many people might not know the whole history of Navistar recently, but we, we were purchased by a company called Trayton. And Trayton is, is a um, global truck manufacturer. It's a spinoff from Volkswagen. Um, and Trayton is, is very focused on, you know, the sustainable side of, of the future. Um, one of the things they are doing is, is trying to, I mean, a big part of their strategy is gaining scale through um, using using designs and and products across all four brands and um doing a more modular approach where where things can can be reused in in different parts of the, of the world um we we are in a couple months gonna have a, a big announcement on on uh probably one of the last um ice big bore engines to to be um, launched in in a, in the U.S. Um, you know probably ever, and it's a derivative of of a, a common product that that is being deployed across the world, and it'll probably be the highest um, highest volume big bore engine in the world. And so they're doing things like that, and and those that's the same approach that, that's going to be taken as we move forward into uh, EV and autonomous trying to to do whatever we can to reuse um designs and products across across different geographies so scale is part of that i think yeah, that's uh, you know that's that's part of what you're saying but what about the uh the your own organization and how do you prepare them it's how does how does how does everybody uh, see this change going, you know, because people don't like change. They like doing things the way they've been doing it for, for years and years. Yeah, we, we've, we've really had to get out of our comfort zone. Um, and there's a lot of things we've been talking about. One of them is, is uh, um, I've, I've put up almost every time we have an all employee meeting, I, I put up the word nimble. Um, because we, we really need to stay nimble. Tur currently, used, used vehicles are two times what they cost last year. And that, that sounds great and sexy. Um, and it sounds like a lot of profits until you recognize 
that we st we have to pay two times what we paid last year for the vehicles to get them in order to resell them <laughs> and then our customers have to have to pay two times what they financed their their vehicle for last year and so th those create challenges um to to our business and and so we're just trying to make sure uh, one of the things we can't do is sit this one out. You know, we support a large dealer network. We support a new truck business. And um, it's scary to buy buy trucks for twice as much as you bought, bought them for last year and hope to resell them. Um, but when I say nimble, I talk about things like um, one of the crazy things I talk about at our all-employee meeting the last time, I, I talked about the fable or the, the book called the dragon under the bed where the little boy uh, kept telling his parents that there was a dragon under his bed and the more they ignored the dragon uh, the bigger it got and once they finally uh, acknowledged that there was a dragon it, it got smaller and so uh, we use things like that just to talk to people and make sure they recognize look hey if we we make a mistake in buying some trucks um, we, we need to just address it proactively and, and move on and figure out what lessons we can learn from it. So those are a few of the kind of cultural things we're doing to try to address um, the change that's coming at us. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's cultural and, and it's, it's a lot of change management that's going on. From what you've seen, Tony, what, what kind of change do you anticipate with your distribution channel? Um, there's been there's there's been a significant amount of uh, of things occurring, and these some of them are not even using one. Yeah, I I think for us the the biggest thing is, you know, right right now and and for the past decade we've had a model that's been reliant on human um, outside sales reps that that take calls and call on customers and. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the transactions are going more digital, but it's not going to be it's not going to be fully there. So we're going to have to have a hybrid model um, and, and invest more in the digital tools to, to allow people to, to do transactions um, with with less um, friction. Mm -hmm. Then when you get to the EV side, um, Kirk talked about it a little bit, but um, EVs are way more expensive and. Um, and so my organization puts residual values on those trucks, um, you know, five to seven years out, and, and we have to stand behind those. And so the questions for us in trying to put a residual value on those trucks include things like, how long is the battery going to last? Are the engineers going to make the next battery backwards compatible so that I can re-battery a truck at midlife? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What will be the cost of that battery, you know, and, and as Kirk talked about, what's the, what's the value of that battery in the secondary market and so forth. And then another crazy thing that, that people started thinking about is in um, ice powered vehicles have, have had a life that, that has basically been tied to the fact that the engine wears out at a certain point. Um, now with motors lasting longer, we're thinking about things like, do we need to have an interior remodel at midlife on, on these vehicles since, since the, it's going to be a different part of the truck that, that kind of wears out um, rather than, than the powertrain. It's, it's probably going to be, you know, that customer tastes are going to be at, at seven years. They may want um, a whole new interior by then. So those are some of the things that are kind of affecting us on the, on the used vehicle side. And as we move to uh, EVs. That's interesting. Uh, you know, I actually, we're, we were open to some question and answer from the, uh, from the audience. And one of them kind of keys into that with Mundar. And that is the reuse of the upfit bodies. Uh, and uh, Traditionally, the upfit lasts much longer than the chassis, mm -hmm. uh, and I guess that you have to move them from one to the other. Is that is that going to change, or is there a or, or is there a compatibility? Well, it's a good question. Um, you know, one thing we're trying to figure out is as we look at a different as all we look at the different uh, OEM solution sets, especially in that. Um, 
I'd say in, from the you know class three, four, five side of things, we're trying to look and see and okay, what's common, what looks common, what doesn't look common. Um, you know, everyone's trying to stay within chassis rails and things like that because at the end of the day, the vehicle, whether it's electric or not, has to load. You know, there's only certain ways that load can be carried. <laughs> You know, and there's some creative things happening out there. So we got to make sure that that you know we're looking at how that works and what can be interchangeable and not. More importantly, I think it just reemphasizes the um, the perspective. You know, like Tony said, what are the wearable items? What are the parts that need to be parts and service components that need to be there? What is an effective parts and service strategy for uh, for upfits and uh, and sodary equipment? Um, you know, so so there's some there's a lot of things that we need to consider in that. You know, the truck, we are going to see a, a shift in what lasts, what doesn't last, what's going to be the replacement cycle for vehicles, what's going to be the service cycle for vehicles. Um, you know, so it may not just be as easy as saying we're going to pull a body off and put it on the next truck. It may be, okay, we got to make sure that the we got to service the body that's on this truck because the truck's going to last longer. Or as we pull things off of that truck and put it on another one, we may need to refurb or modify or do things to it. Um, and really, it's really no different than what we're all considering today in our industry as as we look at things. It just might the time frames might change, and some of the some of the what gets replaced versus what doesn't get replaced may be something that we have to all revisit and think about. Yeah, that brings me to another question. I, I know there's background noise. I can't. It's it's both trash day and leaf blowing day, so I really <laughs> apologize. And next time we we have to change our date. Uh, Speaking of change, we've been talking about all these kind of unforeseeable things that are happening, you know, when when uh, all of us will be further down the road. But there's a lot of short-term change that we're facing right now today, uh, with inflation and the interest rates, six dollar a gallon diesel fuel, uh, all of this, all of this that's occurring, the uh, uh, onsh the onshoring of manufacturing and the infrastructure spending. From your standpoint, uh, and maybe starting backwards, starting with you, Tony, uh, how, how do you see that? You already talked about the fact you're paying, you're paying retail for wholesale. Uh, how how do you how do you see this short term change? And when will use will, will used truck values peak? Um, well, if, if I knew that, Jim, I wouldn't probably be on, on, on this uh, panel, but I do have an opinion about it. And, um, you know, I, one, one of the things that's happening right now is spot rates have softened in the past month. Um, and the, the used vehicle customer is, is typically a little bit more susceptible to the spot market than than a larger carrier who who mainly has has um, longer contracts and so um, that has actually started cooling off prices. It it hasn't really um, cycled all the way through to the retail buyer yet. It's it's started in auction because auction is kind of the most instantaneous thing that you'll see, um, but. But I think that the supply chain constraints are going to continue to constrain um, production for OEMs all the way at least another year. And so um, a, a return to the, the, the numbers, uh, the traditional numbers that we used to remember from, you know, that was pretty stable actually in used vehicles for almost a decade. I don't think we're going to see a return to those um, like anytime soon. And, and I also think that with the inflation that's happened and, and the reshoring, it's unlikely that we're going to reset back to, to the old levels all the way. So there's certainly going to be a correction when the correction happens, it's going to, it's going to settle in, I think at, at a, a higher um, level than what we had seen in the past decade. It's interesting. How about from a standpoint of demand? Uh, because we, we, we demand, see, yeah, demand is, is strong and there's a couple things going on. There's a regulatory environment that's probably going to keep um, demand strong at least through the end of 23. 
I think a lot of people are looking at 24 with a question mark because um, of some regulations that 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 happen um, for uh, January 1st to 24. So there's a potential of a free buy and things like that happening in 23 that, that could keep things pretty solid. Um, and then looking even further out, then there's another another big uh, regulatory event in 27 that, that everybody's looking at, so. Mm. Well, that, that's, so really, uh, it, it's interesting, but this, time the, the the sales levels are dictated by production is what you're saying and that's going to continue so the interest rates and the the outside economic factors for commercial vehicles may not be as affected as yeah and and, and jim the um the supply side is constraining things so the oems can't really react to su to supplying all the demand that's out there today and so right. vehicles on even on the use side vehicle age is getting is is getting higher so there, there's there's an um a latent demand for um newer vehicles but people can't get them so i think that's going to persist at, you know probably another year and a half okay well kirk how about from your standpoint the the interest rates uh, have been stable for so long and uh, the, all of the Fed activities, it's changing drastically, at least what the rates are, uh, maybe terms, mm -hmm. but how, how do you see this short-term change that's occurring and affecting your business? Yeah, I, I think the, the two things that I would address are rates and, and uh, valuation, and Tony's right, there's a, there's a dragon under the bed, and if, we, if we're not thinking about the fact that there's a dragon under the bed, we're, we're going to be in uh, tough shape later. So we're certainly building mi mitigative uh, strategies to help us with, you know, when it sort of comes back into something that's fairly normal. Um, but I do think that we're going to, we're going to be struggling with that for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, even when uh, new production comes back into play, um, 100%, i it, it, it's it's going to take a while for that to to, to happen, I think, uh, just because of supply chain. But rates, uh, you know, rising, it puts pressure on on our business, you know, and how quickly competitors raise their pricing uh, and what their cost of funds may be versus ours. I mean, those are definitely and, and for the end user, you're paying more for a truck and uh, at higher rates. So your payment is going to go up unless there's some kind of structure that that we do, and we're we're trying to build some of those um, to to help our customers. Um, it, it's a little bit like real estate, you know, and and new home new housing starts. I mean, as interest rates on mortgages continue to climb, uh, I think you'll see a little bit of a, a a downturn in activity and maybe pricing on housing, even though there's a fairly big shortage. And historically, in our world, work truck, um, we we tie pretty closely to new housing starts. And so, to the extent there's a little bit of a dip there, I don't know if we'll see a precipitous decline in work truck, but it's something we're keeping our eyes on. Um, we certainly keep it there, but it's very correlative. The new housing starts to work trucks is a very correlative uh, index, uh, according to Steve Tam at Act Research. Um, but th those are short-term issues that we're dealing with every day, no doubt about it. How, how about you, Mundar? Uh, what? How, how do you see it? Well, I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't disagree with what Kurt said. I mean, how new housing starts is a big indicator that we look at to kind of guess what the whole market's going to be doing. And frankly, you know, when you look at new housing starts, maybe softening a little bit. You've got. Um, you know, on the flip side, as, as Tony said, we've got a lot of that infrastructure demand that should be coming our way too. Um, but the big thing for us, the big thing for us on the body side is, is our bodies that we build, you know, they, they don't really mean anything unless there's a truck to put them under or on top of, right? There's yeah. a task underneath that body. And frankly, the supply chain situation um, that we're seeing, and, and it's easy to just categorize it, categorize it all under supply chain. 
Um, but, you know, if you think about it, the, um, you know, the issues still post COVID chip related issues, post COVID, uh, you know, component related issues, all that stuff exists. It's real. Um, but the reality of it is, is, you know, Tony's, Tony's peers over at, uh, at Navistar, as well as, you know, the other OEMs are going to build every truck or vehicle that they can possibly build. Um, and right now the demand cycle is, uh, you know, the demand, the demand strength is outstripping supply, it just is. And the reality of it is, is the short term for us is, is we've got to work with our customers and um, you know, our, our end user customers, as well as our distribution customers to really change the thought process of, hey, you may not be able to walk on a dealership lot to find a truck that you can use for your business today. You might have to plan ahead and really think about what that order cycle looks like and when you think about what that order cycle looks like, okay, then how does that result in what the upfit cycle looks like? How does that result in what the body build cycle looks like? Mm -hmm. So there's a yes. lot of forward, there's, a, there's just an immense amount of forward planning that we're, uh, that we're working through to think about that and inspire, inspire the, the value chain to think differently. Um, you know, it's going to be, it's, uh, you know, like, like, uh, like my pals here both said, it's going to be an interesting next couple of years. It's going to be, um, you know, depending upon, you know, how the OEMs want to handle inventory levels, um, you know, how, how the finance world is treating, you know, residuals as well as, uh, as well as interest rates and lending. Um, there's going to be some very, very uh, interesting periods that we're going to have to manage through. But uh, again, close coordination and communication is going to be critical. Um, you know, trying to understand what that supply cycle is going to look like for chassis. Um, you know, what are, what are our major customers, meaning what I mean by customers, I mean, our major end user customers, um, the infrastructure guys, we tend to talk to a lot to kind of understand, okay, what do you see coming? How do you see it forecasting? Um, you know, it's, it's a big deal that it's a big, actually the word I just used forecasting, you know, in the work truck industry, it's, it's, it's a, it's something that we've got to get, we've got to get better at. I mean, I mean yeah. we are good, but we can get better at it and really think about it. And when you're meeting with a customer, you might not say, hey, here's the truck. It's, you know, let's look at two years. Let's look at three years down the road. What are you going to need? And get our customers comfortable with saying, okay, let's, let's, let's start thinking about that. Let's make some, let's, you know, let's put a marker out there for that. If that marker doesn't, if you don't need that marker in a couple of years, we'll find a place for it. There's going to be demand <laughs> that's going to yeah. take that truck. But uh, but it's definitely a shift that uh, that the entire that the entire industry is uh, is working for work through, and uh, we're going to just have to to, uh, to figure out as we continue here. Well, that's well said. You know the uh, uh, and everyone's really said it. What, what we're doing was we're moving into a, instead of an individual business unit that we're doing in in, in our area, it's all really fleet management for the customers. Um, and we're we're now uh, yeah. have we have to be responsible. We have to coordinate with all of the elements for the customer's needs. Uh, and that issue you talked about planning and strategy is such a key uh, where we have to become counselors. I guess that's also a place where work truck solutions comes in from a standpoint of uh, of helping the dealers, helping the OEMs, helping the outfitters, helping. Uh, everybody involved with the systems, data, and also processes, where we're all going to have to professionalize. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's a it's good that we're in this situation where we can. And I also, uh, from a standpoint of hope, I'm convinced the commercial vehicle industry is going to become more and more the center of how all business is done for transportation. Uh, you're seeing a consolidation of owners of the, re of the retail side, uh, and we're also seeing a, a, a change in how a B2B business relationship is what retail customers are also looking for. Uh, and so in some ways, we're all merging into the same pool of transportation, and the line between retail and commercial is diminishing. Commercial is growing, uh, and, I, and I've got to tell you, from my standpoint, I've, I've had a chance to to have a number of sessions with with the with this group. I I, I would rather be with you than anybody else, the three of you, uh, as we face these changes, because your companies are the top, you're the benchmark, uh, you're going to show the the way for the rest of the industry and and how we how we go forward. And so, 
it's really been a, a pleasure and a, a, a real honor uh, to appear on the screen with you. Uh, and I look forward to uh, doing this again. And I hope we've been able to add value uh, for those in the audience. But we still have, you can still put in questions. Uh, we'll, we'll answer them. Uh, and uh, this, this session is coming to a close. We, we are gonna go to a break, but I wanna make sure everybody recognizes that uh, uh, in about 10 minutes after, we're gonna have a trivia contest. And I think Catherine has some really nice expensive prizes in mind. So you might wanna stick around for that. Anyway, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure and honor. But, uh, enjoy the rest of the summer. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you Jim. Appreciate it. See you guys.